Jean was born in LA in 1926. Her mother Gladys was a film splitter back when film editing meant literally cutting and piecing together actual spools of film. Unfortunately, Gladys suffered through an abusive marriage, then lost her two children older than Norma Jean when, after a messy divorce, her much older ex-husband kidnapped the two children and moved to the Midwest. Because it was extremely difficult for women to make a living wage in that era, Norma Jean grew up with a foster family, and her mother visited on the weekends. When Norma Jean was seven, her mother managed to buy a small home and the two moved in together. To supplement her income, Gladys rented out rooms in her home to actors. It seemed that Gladys and Norma would finally be together, a small, happy family. But it wouldn't last. Less than a year later, Gladys had a schizophrenic break from reality. She was placed in a rest home and then a mental hospital. Norma Jean became a ward of the state. Her mother's friend, Grace Goddard, took over her mother's assets and helped place Norma Jean in foster homes. For the first mm, year and a half or so, Norma Jean continued living in her mother's home with the family of actors who were renting. But they began to sexually abuse Norma Jean. Norma Jean developed a stutter and began to withdraw, probably extremely depressed, scared, confused, and maybe even guilty, although nothing that happened to the young child was her fault. Norma Jean then moved in with Grace for a short time before being sent to an orphanage where she felt totally abandoned. She again tried to live with Grace, but Grace's husband, Doc, began assaulting Norma Jean as well. Norma Jean then moved in with some of Grace's relatives, finding the most happiness and peace with Grace's aunt, Anna Lauer. Norma Jean struggled with many aspects of school, but excelled in writing and was part of her middle school's journalism team. As Anna became too old and sickly to care for Norma Jean, she was forced to move back in with Grace and Doc. Fortunately, very soon after that, Doc's work transferred him across the country and they had to leave, saving Norma Jean from additional sexual abuse. But she faced a different conundrum. She would have to return to the orphanage unless she could find another living situation. As a solution, Norma Jean married Grace's neighbor, 21-year-old James Daughtry, at only 16 years old. Norma Jean was forced to withdraw from school and became a housewife. Eventually, James joined the military, and in 1944, he was deployed to the Pacific. Norma Jean took advantage of her new first-time freedom to start working and become an independent adult. She was quickly booked with a modeling agency, dyed her hair blonde, and began modeling as often as she could get work. Norma Jean worked through an agency under the name Jean Norman, and the owner of the agency described her as extremely hardworking and ambitious. In 1946, Norma Jean got a divorce, as her husband was extremely opposed to her career. Norma Jean was determined to become an actress and began taking acting, singing, and dancing classes. She signed a contract with one agency and selected her famed stage name, Marilyn Monroe. Her first acting contract was a bust with very little work, despite a lot of networking, classes, and modeling connections. Marilyn Monroe's early acting coaches believed that she was too shy to succeed as an actress. She starred in a stage play and then signed a new contract with Columbia Pictures. Here, the Marilyn Monroe we know today was crafted. They altered her hairline, bleached her hair even lighter, and still the contract yielded very little work. Marilyn started dating an influential agency VP who paid for her to have some plastic surgery. He also proposed, but Marilyn refused as she was enjoying her first time freedom. 
Marilyn had a small role in a Marx Brothers film in 1950 and continued modeling, including tasteful nude photo shoots. At the end of the year, Marilyn signed her first contract that would lead to larger roles with Fox. By 1952, Marilyn was named Best Young Box Office Personality and had started dating famed baseball player Joe DiMaggio. Marilyn Monroe actively cultivated friendships with gossip columnists like Hedda Hopper so that she could maintain and control her image. Marilyn wanted to be seen as a more serious actress. She starred in two thrillers, Clash by Night and Don't Bother to Knock, which showed off her more serious side and her ability to explore nuanced roles. But the films received mixed reviews and Marilyn Monroe was forced back into her comedian sex icon box in her next few films. Nevertheless, Monroe was dubbed the It Girl of 1952 and her fame continued to grow. Marilyn began using various medicines to cope with her life, both rising scrutiny and past trauma. Some speculate she had undiagnosed bipolar disorder or anxiety and depression. She was often late to set and had trouble remembering her lines. But years later, after working with her, Broadway director Joshua Logan compared Marilyn Monroe's talent and ability to combine comedy and tragedy to that of Charlie Chaplin. Marilyn's marriage to Joe DiMaggio fell apart for many reasons. He was abusive and Marilyn worked long hours on many films on different coasts. Additionally, Joe DiMaggio hated Marilyn's public sex icon persona, and when she shot the iconic white dress over the subway vent promo for Seven Year Itch, he was furious. That was the end and the couple separated. Marilyn dated Marlon Brando briefly before beginning a relationship with Arthur Miller, a playwright. The studio discouraged this relationship because Arthur was blacklisted in Hollywood and was under interrogation by the U.S. Senate on suspicion of being a communist. Shout out to McCarthyism! Instead of ending her relationship, Marilyn Monroe became an advocate for the blacklisted celebrities she protested McCarthyism and used her connections to criticize the Senate hearings. Marilyn Monroe is one reason it did not escalate further into a truly dangerous senatorial lynch mob, which could have easily led to a nuclear World War III. Her involvement in advocating for peace, open-mindedness, and the blacklisted artists is what supposedly led to the FBI opening a file on her, and tracking Marilyn Monroe throughout her career. Fox sued Marilyn when she tried to end her contract as she felt trapped in roles that were boring and predictable. At the height of her fame, Marilyn beat the Fox lawsuit and started her own production company. This was huge at the time as very few women held or even hold today executive film company titles. The press, who at first had mocked Monroe for trying to escape Fox and then mocked her for marrying Arthur Miller, now praised her as someone who has separated from the herd and set an example for generations to come. Marilyn spent 1955 studying acting under acclaimed actor and director Lee Strasberg. His wife Paula became Marilyn's personal acting coach and Marilyn became a part of their family. Ever the eager learner, Marilyn took the time to really study with the couple. Lee insisted on psychoanalysis as he believed that an actor's ability to confront their trauma is what shaped their performance. Marilyn Monroe's will left all her possessions to Lee Strasberg to be distributed among her loved ones to the best of his ability. Paula and Lee were both outspoken in their defense of Marilyn Monroe in the many documentaries and memoirs that would follow her death. Under her own production company, Marilyn made several critically acclaimed films that cemented in the court of public opinion and the reviews and awards of critical acclaim that Marilyn Monroe was more than just a sexy placeholder. She was a shrewd and talented actress. Some found her difficult to work with because she was a perfectionist. She wanted to do a scene until it was perfect perfect timings, expressions, words, everything. And for that very reason, 
So many of her films were huge successes. Some Like It Hot is still considered one of the best films ever made, but the production process is a legendary nightmare in the film world because of the number of takes and retakes Marilyn insisted on. Despite the complaints of the other actors and the director, it was thanks to Marilyn's high standard of production and the fact that she had learned to use her voice, overcome her shyness, and advocate for herself that the film became so popular. The director, Billy Wilder, fought with Monroe often on set, but after the film's success, said of Marilyn, Anyone can remember lines, but it takes a real artist to come on set and not know her lines and yet give the performance she did. Interestingly, most successful artists hold this same mentality. Beyonce is known for being the hardest working person in music, demanding excellence from her colleagues and herself. But because she is so involved in every step of the process and produces hit after hit after hit, no one complains. Many male directors are known for this same trait and are abusive and dangerous to work with. But instead of mocking them, we line up to see their movies and act in their films and call them misunderstood artists and geniuses. Hmm. Filming with her own production company and then doing Some Like It Hot was hard on Monroe. During this time, she suffered a miscarriage and an ectopic pregnancy. She became even more depressed and took a hiatus in 1959 and divorced Arthur Miller. After her divorce, Marilyn had surgery to remove her gallbladder and the tissue buildup caused by her severe endometriosis. After recovering from surgery, Monroe dated Frank Sinatra for several months before returning to LA. Despite her busy schedule, lack of formal education, and unprecedented fame, Marilyn Monroe was a humble person with a good heart and an open world view. These qualities made Marilyn Monroe a valuable ally. Like Marilyn Monroe, Ella Fitzgerald was an extremely hardworking and talented woman. Unlike Marilyn, Ella was black, and in 1950s racist America, this industry-shaping icon was continually dismissed and ignored. But Marilyn recognized Ella's talent and talked a famous Hollywood club that only allowed white entertainers into featuring Ella in their evening entertainment. Marilyn promised to attend every show featuring Ella and use her star power to promote both Ella and the club. The press loved Ella's talent and Marilyn's star power, and as a result, Ella Fitzgerald went from playing at small clubs that allowed race mixing to headlining large white entertainment venues. This was a huge step for Ella Fitzgerald and a step in the right direction for the entire community of black musicians who were at that time revolutionizing popular music and finally had a bit of a bigger stage on which to share that music. In 1962, Marilyn received a World Film Favorite Golden Globe Award. Working again with Fox, Marilyn shot several movies and photography promos. While shooting Something's Gotta Give, she swam nude in a swimming pool, the first time an actress had ever done something so scandalous at the height of their career. However, struggling to balance the rising costs of the film Cleopatra, Fox was extremely frustrated when Marilyn got sick and the production was delayed. Despite letters from her doctor, Fox fired Marilyn Monroe again and tried to replace her. The director quit in protest and the production collapsed. During this time, rumors of Marilyn and JFK's affair also began circulating, and Marilyn sang the famous Happy Birthday Mr. President song in a dress that shocked with its nude figure-hugging shape and hundreds of sparkling rhinestones. You know, like your average red carpet dress today. Fox started a media campaign to injure the actress, claiming she was mentally unstable, impossible to work with, a diva, and other lies. Marilyn fired back by doing vulnerable and popular interviews with Cosmopolitan and Life, as well as doing a huge photo shoot with Vogue. Norma Jean was a fighter. She was a survivor. She was smart and kind. She defied the enormous odds stacked against her. 
Even though she was oppressed, abandoned, abused, pulled out of school, treated cruelly, she became none of those things in return. But just like Norma Jean's idyllic life with her mother, Marilyn Monroe's fame and success was short-lived. She was found dead in her home on August 4th, 1962 of drug overdose. The death was ruled a probable suicide, but many conspiracies surround Marilyn Monroe's death at the height of her fame and influence. Did she kill herself? Death by suicide is not uncommon in the bipolar community. In a time before mood stabilizer prescriptions and knowledgeable therapists were commonly available, it's more than possible that rumors and a smear campaign could have pushed her over the edge. On the other hand, she was a lot smarter than the public and her male co-stars gave her credit for. She had her fingers in a lot of pies, supported civil rights, owned a production company, and had unprecedented sway over public opinion. In such a position of influence, there were almost certainly people who wanted her dead. Hello, witches, women, and other lovely listeners. I'm Hannah, the bipolar bisexual host of this bi-weekly podcast of Witches and Women. In this podcast, we get to explore the lives of powerful women, both real and mythological. Strong women have historically been labeled as witches or something else equally troubling, taboo, and easy to justify killing or dismissing. I'm telling their stories because most of these tales are amazing and all of them are fascinating. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Google Play and if you do social media, connect with me through Of Witches and Women on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Of course, be sure you also check out the website, which is the most in-depth and exciting resource I can offer you. When you visit ofwitchesandwomen.com, you'll find fantastic merchandise of both the serious and salty variety. Lots of the merchandise is limited edition, so get it while we're still in ancient Greece. You'll also find the Grimoire Gallery, which is our internet gallery curated with art by today's working artists and featuring witches, women, and goddesses of ancient Greece. If you see something you like, you can support a small business by visiting the artist's portfolio sites to see, share, or purchase more of their work. Plus, you can even buy some of their prints starting at just $15 in the Of Witches and Women's shop. If you're not a fan of fake news, then you need to check out the Lamia Library, where I list all of my show notes and other resources and recommendations. Of course, subscribe to the newsletter The Oracle on any page of the Of Witches and Women website. Just scroll down and add your email address. The bi-weekly oracle tells the shorter, fascinating, more obscure stories that we won't get to cover on the show. It highlights grimoire gallery artists, shares simple spells and book recommendations, and more. So don't miss out. Subscribe today. Arope, granddaughter of King Minos of Crete, daughter of King Catrius, was a princess of a famous, beautiful, and wealthy nation-state. Arope had two sisters and a brother, all living in harmony in Crete. However, it was not to be. Catrius received a prophecy that he would die at the hand of one of his children, and of course, this meant his children had to go. Two went into exile voluntarily, but Arope and her sister Klimne were sold to an Argonaut to be trafficked into a foreign country. The Argonaut married Klimne and sold Arope in Mycenae. A beautiful and well-educated woman, Arope rose quickly in Mycenae and caught the attention of the royal family. According to some myths, she married the crown prince with whom she had three children. Agamemnon, Menelaus, and Anaxpia. When the prince died an early death, she married his father, the widower and king of Mycenae, Atreus. Atreus and Ariope raised Agamemnon and Menelaus to become two of the most influential kings in Greek history. The king brothers of Mycenae and Sparta, who united all of ancient Greece to wage war against Troy. 
It was one of the only times all of Greece united under one cause. In addition to raising her three children with their grandfather slash stepfather, Arope had other things to do. Interestingly, King Atreus and his twin brother Theseus were princes of Pisa in the Peloponnesian region, but they killed their older half-brother, the crown prince, and were banished to Mycenae. Somehow, Atreus rose to power there and became king, but when their father died, Pisa was left in a power vacuum, and Theseus and Atreus vied for power once again. In the direct center of the conflict stood Ariope. While married to Atreus, Ariope was having a secret affair with his twin brother, Theseus. Whew! Ariope did not want her husband to become king in Peloponnesia and crafted a scheme to ensure Theseus was granted the throne. To gain the favor of the gods, Atreus promised to sacrifice his best lamb to Artemis. He searched his flock and found a lamb with a fleece of gold. Deciding that that was too good to give up, he asked his wife to hide the sheep and sacrificed his second best. Arape did hold on to the sheep. Then, confident in creating a contest he could win, Atreus challenged Theistus to produce a lamb with golden fleece, and whoever could do so would be granted the throne. Knowing his brother's secret, Theseus agreed, and Arope smuggled him the sheep the night before the challenge. Theseus won, but Atreus was not entirely stupid. He knew where that sheep had come from, and he plotted his revenge. First, he asked his wife to meet him on the cliff edge of the palace. While looking over the water, he pushed his wife off the edge, and she drowned in the sea far below. Then Atreus, modeling his behavior on his grandfather Tantalus, killed his brother's children, who in some myths are his own younger children, or what he thought were his younger children, and fed them to Theseus before telling him that what the meat of the evening was. Theseus fled and ruled Pisa for only a short time before Atreus won back the favor of the gods and overtook Theseus on the day when the sun moved backwards in the sky. Arape's reign was short, but her legacy is immortal. Arape came from a place of trauma and abandonment. She picked herself up and she did the only thing a woman in her position could do to escape slavery. She married well. Then Arape gave birth to and raised two of the most influential kings of ancient Greece. And finally, once she felt secure, she made space for happiness and pleasure in her life with Theseus. She met a tragic end, but she met it on her own terms, choosing Theseus' cause above her husband's. Of course, today there isn't nearly enough documentation on the ancient Mediterranean kings, their various conflicts, and their wives to determine much of Ariope's personality. All we know is her history, her lineage, and her bravery. Her father sold her, she lived on the edge of survival, and had to choose between life as a slave and life on the edge of a political knife. Arope chose what she knew, and the former disgraced princess re-entered the political and religious arena of ancient Greece as a queen. Arope raised her own children better than she was raised, and with the same strength and resolve that she had to use to survive and which her sons used to unite all of Greece in the Trojan War. Listeners, let's talk shop, specifically the Of Witches and Women merchandise shop. We have beautiful prints and t-shirts created by contemporary artists, Salty t-shirts, fierce joggers, magic coffee mugs, witch sister bracelets, stickers, and more merch designed by me as well. Plus, when you buy art, either as a print or a t-shirt, the proceeds go to the hard-working artist. And when you buy the other merchandise, I can afford to buy myself a Pop-Tart. A maybe. Huh. So, take a look at ofwitchesandwomen.com slash shop.
when push came to shove arape was not going to allow kingdom takeovers and mergers she didn't agree with not if she could help it whether her methods or morals were right or wrong her strength and influence is unquestionable even today with so little information she outsmarted her circumstances to become a leader and influencer in a world that had rejected her. Similarly, Marilyn Monroe is a figure of conflict today. She was a drug addict and dated around more than was proper. She was scandalous and she was kind. Through her trauma, she was loving. Through her abuse, she was courageous. Through her life, she did her best to be her best and to promote what she knew was right and important. Marilyn Monroe influenced Hollywood to accept liberal artists again after the Red Scare. She helped Ella Fitzgerald move her career to new heights, and she loved and accepted those around her. She coped with her own betrayals and demons as best she could. In my eyes, she's a hero. Not for what she looked like, but for who she chose to be. Even when the world didn't give her choices, she made them anyways, and for the most part, I think she chose pretty well. That's a wrap on today's episode. Thank you so much for listening. Be sure you and your queens are subscribed to Of Witches and Women on Apple, Google, or Spotify. Please write me a golden review on your podcast app so others can find and enjoy the show as well. Connect to me and the pod on social media and look up ofwitchesandwomen.com for even more great content, merchandise, and to subscribe to the Oracle. Stay fierce, witches. I'll catch you next time. Of Witches and Women is brought to you by SHH Media, LLC.